there are certain, am I live? I am? Okay. There are certain occupational hazards these days to being a speaker that we didn't used to deal with. One of them is that your phone sticks out of your pocket so much that when you get up, it catches on the back of the chair. It flips on the ground and you're delayed coming up. So for a moment, the pulpit is unoccupied. Um, they didn't ask me to do this, but I feel led to do it, so I'm just going to do it. This is further to the um, tithe and offering issue. You know, a lot of times people get kind of narky. That's an Australian term, but I think you can figure out what it means uh, when we talk about money in church. But what most Christians don't know is that the idea of financing a house of worship through the congregation is ancient, like 4,000 years ancient, and it goes right back to the tabernacle, the temple, and later the synagogues that appeared all over the Greco-Roman world. And in the second book of Corinthians, this is not the sermon, it's just a mini sermon. Uh, in the second book of Corinthians, Paul is preparing to take up an offering. And this is Paul the apostle, you know, the guy who's all about grace. Nobody got the joke. This is what Paul says. The point is, he's, he's, you know, he's trying, to, he's trying to make a point, and he's, he's speaking to the Corinthians about whom we will speak separately in a moment in the actual sermon. Um, these are people who are allegedly spiritual, but actually not so much. And he's talking to them about this offering that they've agreed to take up, and basically the Corinthians are not pulling their weight. That's the bottom line. And you can read this for yourself in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And so he says, So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you promised. In other words, I sent some guys to prod you with a stick to give the money that you said you would give so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not as an exaction, not as something that's being extracted from you at the last minute. And then he says, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. A lot of people say, I don't like that prosperity teaching. Well, Paul, in a form, Paul was into that, in a form. So we're not going to say you're going to drive a, I don't know, these days nobody wants a Cadillac. You're not going to drive a Mercedes-Benz or a BMW or an Audi or whatever your choice is, Maserati. Uh, because you give, but the Lord will provide you in abundance according to what you give. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. It's right there in the word of God. And each one must give as he has decided in his heart. So it's a free choice, but whatever you decide to give, you should give. And not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. Now we think of grace as something having to do with like salvation or sanctification or something. And it does pertain to that. But there's this other dimension, and it has to do with abundance. Nope. Okay. Something just fell over. I don't know what it was. Okay. Um, but grace also has to do with abundance and provision. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiently in, sufficiency in all things at all times... You may abound in every good work. In other words, you'll have the provision you need to carry out the work of God. And then he quotes a scripture. He says, he has distributed freely. He is even given to the poor. And his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness and you will be rich in every, enriched in every way. And I don't know why, when I was sitting out there, I was listening to Robbie... Um, uh, I don't even know how to say it. Ask for the offering, pitch the offering, uh, solicit the offering, shake the congregation down. I don't know, but whatever the, whatever the way to say it is, I'm trying to be funny here for a moment because it's a topic where people tense up. But 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 there is this thing that if you sow, you will reap, and God will provide. And Jesus said, if you seek first the kingdom of heaven and His righteousness. All these things will be added unto you. And one of the ways that you make the kingdom first is where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. So if you give your money there, your heart will follow it. Or maybe your heart's there already and the money follows it. I don't know. But either way, they go together. And so this is, this is one of the laws of sowing and uh, reaping. 
<clears throat> and of increase in the kingdom of God. I'm not saying anybody will get rich, but I will say God will provide your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I will say one thing contrary to what Robbie said. He said, try it for a month and see what happens. I would actually challenge you to go read the book of Haggai. It's two chapters long. It's a little bit confusing because the, the calendar that's used is the Hebrew calendar, and we don't tend to know which months those are. If you're a little bit clever, you can figure that out using the internet. But the bottom line is when Haggai challenges the people of God to give, it says that 90 days later, not 30, but 90 days later, as they began doing that faithfully, suddenly the Lord said, henceforth I will multiply your oil and your wine. And so I think the biblical principle is sometimes you may be tested for up to three months as you begin tithing and you may go, I don't know how we're going to do this. I can't even pay our credit card bills now. <laughs> and you're, you're gnashing your teeth. And there is that bit of a faith walk, but something seems to shift for almost everybody after three months. And um, I remember talking about this in much greater length. Uh, one time when I was in Australia, in, in a church that was not doing a very good job with their giving, and uh, people took it to heart, and so people started giving. And I remember there were several stories, but the one that was the funniest of all to me was uh, there was one family in the church, and they needed a new roof for their house. They didn't have any money for the roof, and they weren't sure what they were going to do about it. But they started giving, and they were thinking, this is the money we should be using for the roof that we can't afford, but okay, we're going to give because we should give. And so they're giving and giving and giving. And uh, they call it a cyclone, we call it a hurricane, hit, hit that area of Australia and destroyed a number of homes. And their neighbor's house had the roof torn off by the cyclone. And so the insurance adjuster came out to look at the neighbor's house and uh, you know, wrote it up and, all right, there's insurance coverage. And the adjuster came over and said, hey, you're insured by our company, I want to examine your roof. And the people said, well, nothing happened to our roof. And, the adjuster said, well, I want to look at it anyway because I'm here and I don't want to have to drive back out here, basically. So, all right, have a look. So the adjuster looks at it and goes, yeah, we're just going to replace your roof anyway. Well, that took care of the roof. And I mean, you know what roofs cost. I mean, it depends how big your house is, but it's thousands and thousands of dollars. So you hear these funny kind of stories. You hear about the people of Israel and their shoes didn't wear out during the Exodus. And you go, how did that work? 40 years in the same pair of shoes. Well, God can multiply grace to you in many ways. He doesn't always put money in your bank account. He may just give you what you need. Does this make sense? And I don't know why, but um, I just had a feeling that some of you may be blocked in your finances right now. And so I really want to uh, encourage you and challenge you also to, uh, to be generous in your sowing so that God can be generous back to you. Now, that was probably longer than it needed to be, but anyway, all right. And it got a rousing standing ovation. <laughs> Bless God. <laughs> all right. Oh... Uh. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> tonight we're going to talk about carriers of the kingdom. And I thought, you know, we need to lay a little bit of tracking for this carriers of the kingdom idea. And so um, we're running a, a course in my school right now called carriers of the kingdom. But I want to share some thoughts with you about this, this topic that you may not have heard before. Um, and let me, let me just say up front that these thoughts I'm about to share with you, these are not thoughts that I've taught in this way anywhere else. So in this sense, it's new. Um, I've shared pieces of this elsewhere, but Robbie and uh, Jeffrey and I were having dinner, I guess it was two nights ago. And... Um, we got on this conversation about things of the flesh and things of the spirit. And there was just, there was like a rush in the spirit that hit us in the restaurant. And it was like, oh, the breath of God is on this. And uh, as I thought about that, I said to Jeffrey, I think I want to talk about this on Sunday morning. And he said, go for it. Now, he told me lately he's been doing a 10 minute sort of sermonette. And I already gave you that. <laughs> 
And the more I thought about this, the longer it got, as they say, the tale grew with the telling. So uh, I don't know if it's going to be 10 minutes, but I'll try to keep it under an hour. How's that? It probably won't even be anywhere near an hour, but you never know. Sometimes uh, I wax eloquent. But I want to I want to talk about this concept of foundations of ministry in the spirit, because I don't think many people are talking about this in most places. And, and by the way, this will not be a straight line exegetical sermon. It would be great if I had multiple weeks with you and I could teach it exegetically through all of the passages, but I'm, I don't have those weeks. I'm only here today. And so I'm trying to capture a bunch of concepts that are all interrelated. I'm not going to do violence to any of the texts, but I, I have to pull these things together so that you can get a... Uh, an integrated picture, and hopefully I, I'll pull it off well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, uh, the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthian church, the natural person, the older translations say the natural man, but this really does refer to men and women. So when we're referring to this, we're referring to both men and women who are natural. They, they walk according to the natural order. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him or her. So a natural person rejects the things of the Spirit, maybe even mocks them, or is confused by them. And you get that sort of, huh, whenever people begin speaking this way. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, a lot of people take this verse and they almost dismiss it out of hand. I mean, they acknowledge that it's in the Word of God. They see that there's truth in it, but they aren't entirely sure what to do with it. Um, and so this idea of spiritually discerned is sort of like, yeah, it's kind of airy-fairy out there, yeah, whatever that really means to somebody, but it doesn't mean anything to me. And this idea of spiritual discernment is not something that I myself personally traffic in. And honestly, I think it's kind of goofy. And the people I know who speak this way, they're kind of nutcases. Now, they usually wouldn't say this aloud except maybe at home with their husband or wife, unless, of course, their husband or wife is one of them, in which case they might have enough sense to keep quiet. But, but this, is, this is really, I would say, the, the predominant state, maybe not the universal state, but the predominant state of the American church at this time in history. We have become a carnal people. We are a natural people. We walk according to the flesh, not according to the spirit. And so this is part of our diagnostic on the problem. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. He is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Now, it doesn't say this, so we'll put this in brackets. On the contrary, the spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For, he who, is, for who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ." Paul is saying here that there is the possibility, not the certainty of, but the possibility of a Christian walking in congruence with God in such a way that we think his thoughts after him. And so we have the mind of Christ. Now, this whole concept was new to me when I first bumped into it. Um, and I've been trying to wrestle through it for years. Maybe I'm getting better as I get older. But... Some years ago, I met the prophet Bob Jones. A lot of you would know his name. He's gone to the Lord now, uh, nine years ago, almost 10. <clears throat> he died in February of uh, 2014. Uh, but anyway, I met Bob Jones, and he had these beady, dark eyes. I don't remember now, were they dark brown or just black? But whatever they were, he'd kind of look at you and peer at you. And he was, he was a rough-cut individual. He had a habit of calling men of any age boy, uh, including people of color, which is a pretty inflammatory thing to do. I don't think he meant it racist. He just didn't know better. Um, but anyway, Bob Jones looked at me and he said to me, boy, Papa's going to burn your mind to ash. And I thought, whatever that means, it ain't good. And he said, he's going to do this to get rid of your stinking thinking. And I thought, whatever that is, that's not good either. And he had a way of talking like that. And 
he didn't tend to unpack it very much. So you were left to either be offended or to figure out what he meant. And that right there is part of the dividing line between the natural mind and the spiritual mind. Because if you become offended and just walk away angry, I almost used a different term, but I'm in a pulpit on a Sunday morning. If you walk away angry, you are walking after the natural man or after the, the mind of the flesh. But if you will let it settle on you and work its work in you, you may actually learn something. Because sometimes God speaks to us through the mouth of a donkey. You might remember a prophet who had to learn that lesson. And so he told me that Pop was going to burn my mind to ash and get rid of my stink and thinking, well, what was that? Well, I was newly out of an Ivy League university, and they weren't as bad then as they are now, but they've gotten a lot worse. But that whole mentality has overtaken our country. And with that, um, many people, especially because they consume too much mainstream and social media, even on Rumble, uh, they consume too much of this. And so their thinking is being crafted by natural means rather than by spiritual means. Does this make sense? And so what Bob was saying is, you know, all that great learning that you have, and I was filled with a lot of it, uh, he, he's going he's gonna to burn that down. He's going to take that out because it's, it's actually learning that is not assisting you in your own pursuit of the things of God, in the things of the kingdom. And in fact, it is blocking you from becoming a spiritual man, somebody who walks by the Spirit. And so what is the goal of the Christian life? Well, I've just suggested it to you. There are many answers to this question, and I suppose they'd be nearly as varied as the speakers, but I want to suggest to you that the goal of the Christian life is to come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Paul uses this language in Ephesians 3.14, and this, this itself could mean many things and could be several sermons, but among other things, it means to become mature Christians who are led by the Spirit of God. Now, this is different from being filled with the Spirit of God. There are people who are filled with the Spirit who are not led of the Spirit. The entire Corinthian church seemingly had this problem. They were talking in tongues. They were moving in miracles and healing, uh, but they also had somebody who was sleeping with his mother-in-law and they were doing nothing about it. And they had some other problems, like they couldn't discern the body of Christ, and so they're taking communion in a way that dishonored the Lord, and sickness was breaking out in their midst, and they didn't have enough sense to figure out why that was happening. It's all found in the scriptures. I'm, I'm not citing every verse because I'm already rixing the clock, but, but this, is a, this is a kind of a big problem in the church of Corinth. And so to become mature Christians means we are led by the Spirit of God. Paul uses another term for this. He talks about walking in the Spirit or by the Spirit. And in this sense, we become disciples, replicas, or the word Paul uses in Romans is icons, exact replicas that reflect divinity through us because we are partakers of the divine nature by the Spirit of God. We're not divine in ourselves. We're just the dust of the earth. But because that Spirit of God has come into us, we reflect that just as in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, an icon reflects the divine presence. And this is why people look at icons when they pray. This isn't your style. That's fine. I'm just explaining to you how another branch of the church thinks about it. And so in this sense, we become disciples, replicas, icons, people who reflect the glory glory of God. And so that should lead us to a question. How on earth does this actually work? What is that process we have to go through? Well, I'm going to give you a series of principles that are taken from the language of Jesus and Paul that hopefully will walk you through that to help you understand it. And in so doing, what I want to happen, hopefully, is to create a diagnostic template for you to lay down on your own life to say, here's why it doesn't work for me as it should. So that you can zero in, am I having a problem at point one or point six? And with that, hopefully we can all get further down the road. So the first principle here is about the kingdom of heaven. Now, Jesus said we are to seek it first and we're to seek the righteousness of the kingdom. And if we make that our number one priority, seek ye first the kingdom of God, or heaven, then all these things will be added unto you. Now, all these things, it includes financial provision, but I already gave that talk, so we're not going to deal with that now. But all these things, all these matters of the kingdom, 
all of them will come to you if the kingdom becomes your number one priority. And of course, you know what is priority to you because it's the first thing you do in the morning. It's what you think about all day long. Even if you have a normal job and you're at the office, still God is on your mind. You have the presence of the kingdom on your mind. You're thinking about how can I be more useful to him? Is the Lord opening a door for me to share with this person today or whatever it might be? All of that is part of that seeking first. But note that it says seek. And seek means you have to do something active. It's an attitude of mind. It's an attitude of soul. Thank you. And it, it keeps you going in the direction that you should. So the kingdom of heaven that we seek, though, it is a realm and not a place. And that's a, that's a concept that many people don't get very readily. So Jesus said in Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of heaven is in your midst, which could be interpreted, the kingdom of heaven is in the middle of a group of people. Maybe the kingdom of heaven is here in this room right now. That might be a way of thinking about it. But it can also mean not just in your midst among you, threading back and forth, if you will, like some dynamic river, but the kingdom of heaven is in the middle of you. It flows from out of you if you are a kingdom seeker and you are connecting with God's realm as opposed to the physical locale. So the kingdom is individual and it arises within each person who receives it. And it has its own set of values and ethics, and they are common among all who dwell in this realm. So if you meet a kingdom seeker from Beijing or Seoul, or if you happen to, Pyongyang, I've met these people, not in Pyongyang, but, but they were from there. Or I was in Jordan just about six weeks ago. And so we could say, even in a Muslim country, if they are a person of the kingdom, it's remarkable how similar our language is. It's remarkable how much we are congruent. Our language may be different in terms of Arabic versus English, Korean versus English, but the actual underlying language, what we're concerned with is, is actually very similar. And what did Jesus say? It's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth will speak. And so you can gauge whether that congruence exists irrespective of the human language you're using by what is the heart language? What is the concern? What is that which captures us and draws us along? Does this make sense? So the kingdom is in your midst, it's in your middle, and it flows out of you. This is one of the key concepts that goes with being a carrier of the kingdom. And again, that's tonight's message. So we're not going to say a lot more about it. But it's individual, and again, these values and ethics become defining principles by which we live. And if we are truly kingdom seekers, seeking first the kingdom and his righteousness, then we would not and we dare not violate them. Not only because we realize that it will have a consequence in our life, but even more importantly, we realize it would offend our king. And we want to remain... We want to remain in constant contact. We want to remain in communion with our father. I can use the language of king because he's the boss, but I can also use the language of my father, which we don't tend to do as much, but Jesus was always talking about his father. And I think the fact that we don't use that language so much in American Christianity reflects our own alienation from him, just as we are often alienated from our earthly fathers. And I don't want to offend my father. I love my father. And there have been times when I've been tempted to do whatever, not even saying it's something, one of the big gross sins, but I just stop and I'll say, my father would not be pleased. And that's enough to, to make sure I'm still seeking his kingdom first. Now, the kingdom of heaven is in our midst, but the kingdom of heaven can actually overtake an area. It can overtake a region without being a place. We might say it's a zone, a zone of the kingdom. What might that look like? Well, we know that there are certain parts of the world where there are hot spots of revival. Sometimes a church comes under a season of visitation and maybe for several weeks or months, things are kind of going off and even people will start coming from everywhere to visit it. Does anybody remember Toronto or Brownsville? 
or if you're a little older, the Vineyard, or Calvary Chapel. I mean, all of these are examples of that. There was a zone around these areas. It wasn't just that church, although usually it was centered on a church. It was that that whole region was somehow under some kind of a visitation. So just a few weeks ago, the National Review, which is a magazine I like to read um, a lot, and if you don't, you should. Um, the National Review had a cover article, and the title on the cover was, What is Texas? What is Texas? Well, the whole point of the article is that Texas is more than a place. It's not just a big state with you know, certain boundaries and so forth. Texas is a mindset. It's a way of life. And we might say, similar to that, the Rocky Mountains are a region. And of course, Idaho is part of that region. So, however, we could say Idaho is not the kingdom of God. You might think it is, but it's not. Idaho is not the kingdom of God. And for that matter, neither is the entire Rocky Mountain region. But what we can say is that as we think about the Rocky Mountain region, and it isn't just Idaho, might be Montana, it could be Utah, it could be Colorado, could go all the way down to Arizona and New Mexico, but there are certain common traits, there's a mindset, we might even call it a spirit, but sometimes when we say spirit, people start thinking demons, and I don't mean that, I just mean an ethos, I mean a sort of a culture that is unique to the Rocky Mountains. People like to buy, drive pickup trucks, they like to ski, can't really do that in the flatlands very well, um, guns are part of the culture, and not in the sense of going and murdering people, but hunting's a big part of the culture. Fly fishing. All of these things kind of define some of the ethos of the Rocky Mountains. And so these common traits become the, the, the defining characteristics. And when we think about the kingdom of God, it's a similar kind of thing. I'm, I'm not, just to be clear, I'm not tying any of the things I named to the kingdom of God. I'm simply illustrating for you what this concept might mean. And yet for a lot of people, they want to define it to this region. If I can only live in Tennessee, more particularly Franklin, Tennessee, a suburb of Nashville, I will be 20 miles from any known form of sin and I will have found Christian Mecca. Wrong. Well, that's why everybody's moving to Nashville. And they're having this huge you know, population explosion because all the Christians are trying to get away from sin in America. But the kingdom of God doesn't exist in that way. The kingdom of God is dynamic. It's a realm. It's, a, it's when God's rule breaks in. And so now that we understand that the kingdom of God is a realm, but not necessarily a specific location, we can still say that there will be moments, sometimes long moments, where the kingdom of heaven will be manifest in a particular area and people will come seeking it like the birds of the air wanting to nest in the branches of a tree. Somebody famous told a story about that, but you can fact check that. Nobody got the joke. But here's another truth. Jesus said this about the kingdom of God, John 3, 3, you must be born again to see the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And this is one of the reasons why we preach the new birth. It's not the only reason, but I do want to suggest to you that it's much bigger than the very uh, self-centered and personal, I want to escape going to hell. That's a good enough reason, by the way, to get born again. But there's actually a global reason behind this, and it has to do with our prosecution of our Father's agenda on the earth, that we could partner with it, but we can't even see his kingdom unless we are born again. So the entryway is to experience this new birth. And the word see there, horao in Greek, it means to see with the eyes, but it also means to perceive, which is to say we look on it and we understand the deeper reality or the more profound meaning or the spiritual dynamic of what is going on in the midst of looking at something. Moses had this with the burning bush. He saw the bush burning, and he says, I will turn aside to see this great sight. And he goes to look, and there he sees the angel of the Lord in the bush. But he didn't initially see the angel of the Lord. He saw him as he got closer, as he stopped and focused on it. And so there's literal physical seeing. There's the perception that comes underneath that. 
And it also means horao, this third, this word to see. It has a third meaning, which means to experience it. So when we say you can't see the kingdom of God, we're also saying you can't step into the dynamic of kingdom living, kingdom reality, kingdom breakthrough. You can't be a carrier of the kingdom without being born again. Now, for some people, they say, I don't like that. That's exclusionary. Don't you know we're supposed to be an inclusive people? This is the 21st century. We're done with all those old paradigms. No, we're not. We're not done with them because our father is not done with them, and we have to speak as he speaks. So that's point one. The kingdom of heaven is a realm. It's not a place. And there's only one way in. It's through the new birth. And once we're in it, we have to make an intentional effort to keep it as our number one priority. There are a lot of things that can take us off of that priority. Sometimes it's our career, sometimes it's our family, sometimes it's our hobbies, sometimes it's our own carnality and desires. It could be many different things. But the point is we have to stay on that. All right, the second thing we can say about founding foundations of ministry of the Spirit is that now that we are born again, we are allowed to see the kingdom of heaven. In other words, it opens the way for us to enter into kingdom life and power, but it doesn't guarantee it. And many people think, yeah, now that I'm born again, I've got the whole enchilada. Wrong. Now you are going to heaven, so if your only idea was to buy fire insurance for your life, I guess you accomplished your means. <clears throat> but God's calling us to a higher, I guess the French word, raison d'etre a higher reason for living or being. That's what we're really being called to. So being born again allows us to see the kingdom of God without guaranteeing that we will see it, see it unless we seek it. That's why Jesus said you have to seek it. And to go back to the verse that we read out of 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural person... The person who lives by natural means, fallen thinking, fallen emotions, the way of the old man or woman before redemption and continues in that vein, we might call them an unsanctified person, but the person who lives in that way, they do not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They will not even perceive that there is a kingdom reality to be had. They'll simply go on about life as we'll say an earthling and i don't mean like earthling versus martian i mean as somebody who is of the earth somebody who lives on an earthly plane with their thoughts down here rather than on the things of the spirit that that the scripture commands us to fix our minds on things above does this make sense and so if we understand that, then we understand why Jesus said in John 7, 24, stop judging by mere appearances and judge justly, John 7, 24. Now the word there, justly, to judge justly, it's the word dikaios. It's the same root word for righteousness, judge in a righteous manner. And righteous judgment is, and this is interesting, if you you know, drill into the word for righteous, dikaios, if you drill into it, it means innocent, faultless, and guileless. In other words, stop judging with an agenda. Stop judging with motives. Stop judging with stinking thinking, the very thing that Bob Jones told me I was going to have to have burned up in my mind. And it's used also to describe a person whose way of thinking or feeling or acting, this dikaios word, is wholly conformed to the will of God. We could say yielded, submitted, willing to allow our Father to change our own desires and agenda and motivations according to his own will, and who therefore needs no correction in heart and in life. We see this when Jesus meets Nathaniel, and he looks at him, he says, there is a true Israelite. He has no guile. This is a righteous man. And I think a lot of Christians today, because of their own stinking thinking, because of their own thoughts about various matters, because of their own ambitions, because of their own whatever, they are living in a realm where their thoughts actually bound and constrain them such that even if they're born again, they're not actually coming to what 100 years ago they were calling the higher life. But there is a way to live higher. And I want to suggest to you that 
that we're moving toward that if we follow these points. And so this dichotomy of seeing by the spirit and by the soul, we see it in play with Peter the apostle when Jesus, they've just come off the Mount of Transfiguration and Jesus says, um, we're going to Jerusalem now and I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be handed over to the chief priests and the Pharisees and um, they'll do to me whatever they want uh, and I'm going to die. And just before this all happens, Peter's saying, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Well, Jesus says the father, but how did the father reveal it? By the spirit. So at that moment, Peter's living in a moment of revelation. He's living under the leading of the Spirit. But as soon as Jesus says, oh, by the way, I'm going to die, what does Peter say? Oh, this will never be. And so now Jesus rebukes him. And when he rebukes him, what does he say? Get behind me, Satan, because your thoughts are not on the things of God, but on the things of men. Get behind me, Satan. So that's Matthew 16, 22 to 23. It took Peter all of seven verses to go from being in the spirit to being in the flesh. Some of us can do it faster than seven verses. On a good day, we might do it in eight. But, but we see this flip-flop that can happen. And so part of the challenge of the Christian life is to stay in the realm of the spirit where the mind is fixed on the things of God. We'll talk about this more in a moment. And so we see this dichotomy in Peter and similarly the Corinthians, spirit-filled believers though they were, they were carnal even though they were spiritual. And so Paul says to them right after what we read in 1 Corinthians 2.14, Paul says, but I brothers, I'm now in 3.1, I could not address you as spiritual people, but as carnal people or people of the flesh. Paul is drawing the distinction between spiritual thinking and carnal thinking, and he's directing it at this spirit-filled church. Why? Because although they're spirit-filled, they are not walking by the spirit. They are not led by the spirit. And in this hour, what we have to do is we've got to become people who walk by the spirit of God. This is the summons that the Lord has out there. And he says, by the way, you walk in the flesh as infants of Christ. He uses that similar language in Galatians when he says that, um, that when he's using the language of pedagogy and he says, you know, when, when someone's uh, under tutelage, even if they're, even if they're a believer, they, they look like a non-believer. This is found in Galatians 3. And so he's saying, Corinthians, you're born again, but you actually don't act like it. You don't live like it. And all of these things that are amiss in this church are indications that you are not walking by the Spirit. You're just Spirit-filled. Which is to say, you can actually have the baptism in the Holy Spirit, even speak in tongues. But if you do that and your will is not conformed to His will, then you are actually falling short of the highest and best in the Christian life. And so he says, and therefore I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it, and even now you are not yet ready. For you are still of the flesh, even though you're spiritual people. You're not acting like it. You're not being dominated by the Spirit. You're not walking in the Spirit. For while there is still jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? So Paul is saying there are diagnostics we can run on whether we are Spirit-led people. And at least in their case, I don't think this is an exhaustive list. It's a representative list. It's, 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 it's applicable to them, and it might be applicable to any of us. But there are some other places where he addresses this kind of thing. He says, when there's jealousy and strife, that's an indication that you are not spirit-led. Wow. Well, we just laid the ax to the root of all the church gossip, <laughs> all the backbiting, all the anger, all the factionalism. So the Corinthians were carnal, and Paul said, I can't even address you as spiritual men and women because of this. All right, our third principle is that the kingdom of heaven is a spiritual realm, not a physical one. Now, 
anybody who thinks that we're going to bring the kingdom of God through politics has already fallen into this. Because Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world when speaking to Pilate. I'm not saying we shouldn't seek for righteous government. We should. But we should also rec recognize that the kingdom of God always suffers violence and violent men and women do violence to it. And so throughout history, people who have sought to live righteously and even to build righteous societies, from time to time things happen, whether internally through revolution or externally through invasion or whatever, maybe plagues and pestilence, I don't know. But things happen that can disrupt the flow of that. <clears throat> and so when we talk about the kingdom being a spiritual realm, not a physical one, this doesn't mean that it's imaginary or fictitious. Some people would like to argue that way, but that would be wrong. It only means that it's invisible to the naked eye. So for example, you're sitting here listening to me in Idaho. Can you see China from here? No. That doesn't mean China doesn't exist. It just means you can't see it. It's a real place. Get on the right airplane, fly enough time, touch down, you'll be in China. China is findable, but it's not your reality right now. You're probably glad about that. I'm glad it's not my reality. <clears throat> so you can't see it. And similarly, when we think about this, it operates on radio spectrum that you cannot see. Not only can you not see it, you can't hear it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, you can't touch it. You wouldn't even know it's there, it's surrounding you. And right about now, someone's phone's gonna go off because, because I'm talking about phones. But we live by those realities all the time. And so the kingdom of God is like this. Even if you can't see it with your eyes, it doesn't mean it isn't real. You can't see the radio spectrum that runs your phone, that if you need to drive somewhere, guide you to your destination, or let you order a pizza, or whatever you do with it, call your friend or husband or wife or whatever, send texts, etc. That's all happening with stuff you cannot see. It doesn't mean it's not real. And a lot of us have been trained to think that spiritual means nonsense and fictitious, and that would just be flat wrong. There is a spiritual realm. It is as real as electromagnetic spectrum or as real as China, to use my first example. <clears throat> and people often go astray trying to bring about the kingdom of heaven through soulish means. And one of the other principles that we're going to talk about here in just a moment, is that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. So if we want to accomplish spiritual work, we must do it according to the spirit. We have to walk with the spirit, so thus the importance of being spirit-led. And as we walk with the spirit, we can actually give birth to spiritual work which will endure. But if we do it according to the soul, according to our fallen emotions or our fallen thinking, if we do that, well, then we're going to give rise to the flesh. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. So we have a high motivation to learn how to stay in sync or synchronicity with the spirit. Now, when we think about this business of flesh and spirit, Flesh, in this sense, is not always literal flesh and blood. It means the carnal thinking and the carnal emotions. And here's what Paul has to say about this. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. For those who are living according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Huh. So where you have your mind fixed that's going to guide where you go. If you're on fleshly things, if you follow stinking thinking, to quote Bob Jones, you're going to get stinking thinking results. You're going to give birth to flesh. But if your mind is set on the things of the Spirit, it will, this will inevitably guide you into giving rise to the works of the Spirit. And just so, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, and the mind set on the flesh is death. That's the carnal mind. It is soulish. Whereas, verse 6, the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. So there's a lot we could say about that. That could be its own sermon, but let's just say this. 
as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Or as a woman thinketh in her heart, so is she. You can give rise to death all around you. And it will look just like the fallenness of the world around you. Much of the church functions this way. Or you can give rise to spirit outcomes that are born of the Holy Spirit of God if your mind is fixed on the things of the Spirit. There are people I know, they go through life leading people to the Lord all the time. I mean, I'm talking like maybe in a bad week, 15 in a week, get saved. Or if evangelism isn't your bag, uh, they have, I don't know, a dozen or more healings a week or a dozen or more deliverances in a week or whatever it might be. But that's because their minds are fixed on that and they're on the lookout. They're, Father, what are you doing? I'm trying to stay in step with you. Where are you moving, Father? As opposed to, yeah, just give me a latte with a double shot. I got to get out of here and get to work. Did you hear the difference? And so with our appetites and our carnal desires and our emotions, we actually can we can be in the realm of the soul or in the realm of the spirit. Now, Paul speaks of this with some clarity in Galatians chapter five. He says, but I say, walk by the spirit. This is the same idea as being led by the spirit of God. This is what we are commanded to do. Walk by the spirit. And if you do this, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You'll move off of that fallen way of life. Soulishness is another word that I'm using for it. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. There is a dichotomy here between the soulish world and the spiritual world. And they're actually at war with one another. Paul says that in Romans. We won't go there, but it's, it's in there. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, <clears throat> and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Because the appetite of a truly spirit-born, spirit-filled, and spirit-led, all three, born, filled, and led, person is to carry out the works of his or her father in heaven. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. And then he goes on and he gives examples, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, which is... Well, I think we know what sensuality is, but it, it's, it's showing too much. And it's also suggestive talk and other things like that. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife. So again, divisions among people. Jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions and divisions, envy and drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So not exhaustive, but this is a pretty good sampling and we all know what these things are kind of intuitively. We could look them up in a dictionary and clarify it a little more closely, but I think as Clarence Thomas once said, I know pornography when I see it. I know the flesh when I see it. And so he speaks of this and he says, I warn you as I warned you before. In other words, Galatians, I've talked to you about this and you're not paying attention. I'm not there now, so I'm writing a letter to reemphasize this, but you really need to pay attention to this. I'm warning you as I warned you then that those who do such things, watch this, will not inherit the kingdom of God. What does that mean? That the very thing you think you want to walk in, you are your own worst enemy. You are shutting it down because you are not being led of the spirit. You are not walking in the spirit. You're saying it's good enough that I'm spirit filled or born again. Boom, mic drop. And this is the problem with the Western church. I could, I'm going to expand it beyond America. It's going on in Canada. It's going on in Australia. It's going on in New Zealand and all of Western Europe and a big chunk of Eastern Europe. All these lands that we used to call Christendom, listen, the barbarians are at the gate. And it's, if, if I were a commander on a battlefield, I would say my right and left flank just collapsed and we are being overrun. If anyone ever saw the movie, we were soldiers once and young, we need to call in a broken arrow. And this is the fruit of what comes of that because the kingdom will cease to manifest and therefore that thing that I called a realm, which in my example, I talked about the entire of the Rocky Mountain states, it might contract into some little town, Hayden, Idaho. 
And we're like, yeah, but the kingdom's supposed to go out from here and it's supposed to invade all of Idaho and Montana and Utah and Colorado and we're supposed to take the northern part of the Rockies. Well, good luck if you're walking according to the flesh because now the kingdom will not come to be. And it's not because God is unwilling, it's because he has no willing vessels who are walking not according to the spirit, but according to the flesh. And this has a lot to do with this soul-spirit dichotomy. Where is your mind? Where are your affections? This is the world that we are dealing with right now. And so when we think about this, what we see is that I, I scrolled my notes. <laughs> when, when we think about this, we, we have to stipulate to a point that for many of you, this is going to be a hard one. Because I know a bit about how the AG works and the theology of the assemblies of God. But let me just be clear, it's not unique to the assemblies of God. It's all over most of Protestantism. We're all kind of drinking from the same well here. But flesh or soul and spirit are not the same. But many people have been taught that soul and spirit are the same. This is false. And until we get that clear in our minds, we will not ever walk in the spirit as we should. Hebrews 4.12 says this, The word of God is living and active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces unto the division of soul from spirit. And then the writer to the Hebrews expands on that in case you didn't get it. And he says, of joints and marrow. Now, where is marrow found? In the bones. If you've ever cracked a bone, maybe not your own, but maybe you're a hunter and you've shot an elk or a deer or something. I couldn't use this example in New York City. But, but you shot an elk and you, you crack the bone and inside is the marrow. Some people like the marrow. It's, it's rich in nutrients and they like to put it on bread and stuff like that. So it, it's usable. Um, fancy restaurants will serve beef, beef marrow next to an order of bread and you can you know, put it on your bread and eat the bone marrow. But does marrow look like a bone? Not at all. Bone is hard. Uh, marrow is soft, bone is white, marrow is mm, whitish, more gray, but anyway. Um, they're not the same, but they occur in the same space. And unless you crack the bone, you would never see the marrow, correct? All right, so the writer to the Hebrews is even using an earthly illustration. By the way, the Spirit of God is falling on you, and that's why you were shaking in that way. The Lord is speaking to you through this. I'm pointing that out because sometimes we don't see where the spirit is moving. And what this whole sermon is about is how to discern properly and move in the spirit. So something's breaking through here. I'm happy to see that. But the writer to the Hebrews is using this bone and marrow illustration to show us that spirit and soul are not the same thing. And in case you wonder, in Hebrew, the word for soul is nefesh, and it refers to the flesh which is made out of the dust of the earth, and it is also used to refer to the soul. Whereas the word for spirit is ruach, many Christians know this word, and it proceeds from the mouth of God. It does not come from the dust of the earth, and they don't even sound the same, do they? So just linguistically, this doesn't work to say that they are the same. In Greek, we have the same issue, just different words. The Greek word, depending on whether you're speaking Koine Greek or Classical Greek, it's either suche or psyche. But either way, it sounds like the word psychic or psychology, something like that, the life of the mind, whereas spirit is pneuma. They don't sound alike because they aren't alike. And yet many Christians have been sold this bill of goods. And so we have to be clear about this and stipulate to this fact that, that soul and spirit, they can look very similar to one another, but actually the purpose of God in us is that our soul and our spirit be clearly delineated and his spirit, I'll say this one's the spirit, his spirit fills our spirit man or spirit woman to the degree where we begin yielding to his spirit and walk by the spirit. And in so doing, we bring the desires of the flesh, the suche, the soul, the nefesh in Hebrew, that comes under the domination and the rulership, the dominion of the spirit. And therefore we are now people who can become 
theologically and ontologically carriers of God's kingdom. That's what this is about. And many people do not understand that. And so Jesus says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And again, flesh and soul, for the purposes of what we're doing here, they're not the same word in, uh, in English, but they arise from the same word in both Hebrew and Greek, which is to say, fleshly thinking is soulish thinking. Soulish emotions are fleshly emotions. There's a reciprocity in all of this. And so those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, and the mind of the flesh is death. It's the carnal mind. It's soulish. And the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Well, we've already said that spirit-filled doesn't necessarily mean spirit-led, and so we have to become people who move into that. And our last point is that those who are led by the spirit and this is also important, and this came up in our dinner conversation. Those who are led by the Spirit, among the many things that come from this, they begin having a sense of God's divine timing. So for prophets, they may become times and seasons prophets. And for people who are just waiting on whatever it is that they're waiting on, they may realize that there, there are seasons in God when things can occur and then there are seasons when they don't occur. It's not that they're impossible, it's just that the Father's not doing that. And so with that, Jesus said this, John 5, 17, my Father is working until now and I too am working, John 5, 17. Some people say, my father is always at work, all right? My father is always at work. He's always doing something, but that may not mean that he's doing this thing right here that I want him to do at this moment, although I could ask him, and if I ask in expectation, he might give me what I ask because I ask in confidence. I have a whole teaching on asking and receiving what you ask for. But, but again, this will take us too far afield, and I'm watching the clock. And I'm over 40 minutes now for my 10-minute sermon. More like 50 minutes. So, my father is always at work, and I myself am working. But then two verses later in John 5, 19, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. Now, some people want to turn this into a subordinationist text. That's to say, the son is subordinate to the father. The son is not subordinate to the father. They are co-equal. We are Trinitarian Christians here. We are not modalists, nor are we, um, nor are we subordinationists. So Jesus had the power, but he didn't have the will. He would not do something that was contrary to what his father was willing to do. And, and with that, I don't mean it in the way that we sense I am willing, but rather, is he at this moment of his own sovereign will doing that? Because if he's not doing that because he wills it to be so, I won't do it even if I have the authority to do it as the son, because my, I yield to that in order that my father and I may stay in synchronicity. If I were to break that, I would actually be in sin because I would now become soulish. And there's a lot of people who want to minister in the spirit according to a soulish dynamic. Now, let's be clear. Our father's very generous. He loves to heal. He loves to work miracles. He loves doing all of these things. So often it's like a big banquet table. Just woo let's go. But you do have to see what is the father doing. And sometimes he'll break out here in the room versus there in the room. Sometimes there'll be a whole section that just... People say, well, why is it happening over there? Because the Father wills it to be so. It doesn't mean he's going to bypass everybody else. It's just that's what he chose to do to start the party. Yeah. Well, I don't like that. We'll get used to it. Because he's in charge and you're not. Now, I remember years ago when I was learning to do this, this was part of my stinking thinking going away. I'd go to these meetings and John Webb would say, oh, the Holy Spirit's on that person back there. And I'd be going... I don't see anything. But sure enough, you know, if something would happen, they'd fall out or start crying or they'd get healed or whatever. I go, how does he do that? Well, the reason I couldn't do it was because my mind was set on the flesh. 
rather than on the spirit. And it took me a couple of years of hanging around John Wimber, and I don't mean two, I mean more like four or five. But eventually I started to get the hang of it, and I've gotten better at it over the years. But it's a hard transition to make when you're somebody who's used to living either by your constant rationality and thinking, or if you're one of those people who's been trained by our culture to be offended and triggered all the time, and so you're constantly living in carnal emotions. Carnal emotions and carnal thought are not the same thing, but they will get you to the same end point, which is no kingdom. You will be living in death. And what our Father wants to do is bring life. So truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. Well, if that's true of Jesus, it's true of us too. So Jesus had the power, but he did not have the desire or the will to operate independently of the Father. Many of us do that because we have our own best ideas about what's going on. And I remember when I was just working for John, I was a young intern, and you know, people would bring up all this stuff and John would say, can we just let the Holy Spirit run the church? People would be like, what? He'd say, can we let the Holy Spirit run the church? Well, no, we need to have a board meeting and vote some resolutions and like get going. And he'd say, all of that is nervous fleshly energy. Let's seek the mind of the Lord. Let's get the mind of the Lord. And when we get that, then we'll do that. It's slower, but it's way more effective. So Jesus had the power, but he didn't have the will to operate independently. And that's because he only spoke and acted based on what was shown to him. Now, once we understand that, and this deals with the times and seasons issue, it explains the healing of the lame beggar in Acts 3, 6. I mean, everybody who's been a charismatic for more than an hour has heard, well, why didn't Jesus heal the man at the gate beautiful in a, that got healed in Acts chapter 3 by Peter? And the answer is the father had the power and so did he. But the father wasn't doing that at that moment for whatever reason of his own sovereign will, and we're not told why. The father decided to leave that one for Peter and John to heal maybe to raise the issue with the Sanhedrin when they get arrested so that it would be in front of them again, hey, you killed Jesus. But did the father want to heal the man? Of course he did, he got healed. Similar to the man who was by the pool of Bethesda, 38 years, why did God let him suffer? God is not fair. That's absurd. But there was a, there was a higher reason that the works of God would be seen in this man. But he had to suffer 38 years. I know, take it up with God. You are not more righteous nor more compassionate than he is. And a lot of times people kind of get on their high horse and we're seeing a lot of this uh, in the very carnal church um, that is overtaking much of our historic denominations. We're seeing it a lot in social media. We're seeing it a lot in mainstream media. And, and it has, by the way, its own thread and theme with a lot of modern news events. I'm not going to particularly comment on that, but, but just be careful that you don't get drawn in because we live in a culture of offense. And if there's one thing that will really shut down the kingdom in your life is if you become an offended person. Learn to be unoffendable. And so we see in this healing of the beggar, he does ultimately get his healing. And so it's not that it wasn't the father's will, it was the timing, timing, timing. And so we have to learn to see what is the father doing and when is the father doing it. Now we can certainly petition, speed up the timeline. Would you, would you get to it, please, father? And oftentimes just because of a faith-filled prayer, he will accelerate that timeline because he is loving and gracious. But even if he doesn't, that doesn't call into question who he is. It simply means the timing is not yet right. All right, so what are we saying in conclusion? Well, we seek to build disciples, people who live as Jesus lived. Jesus lived under the domination of the Spirit. It was how he stayed in communion with his Father. And we want to walk as he walked, which is to say, be Spirit-led. And we want to minister as he ministered, which is to say with great effectiveness. So this means having uh, the advancement of the kingdom of heaven as our highest priority. And it also requires becoming people who are spirit led so that we see what our father is doing and we don't get out of timing with him. 
Now, there's a lot of things that can block us from getting to that state. I've already said that. I read a list out of Galatians 5. Um, similar to that, if we adopt the right attitudes and we have the fruit of the Spirit, that can actually accelerate our ability to hear God and to stay in synchronicity with Him. So it's kind of like a two-edged sword that way, whether it's fruit of the flesh, fruit of the Spirit. We can collaborate and cooperate with God in this process. And so my encouragement and challenge to you uh, is that you become people who are truly spirit-led, not just spirit-filled. And if you haven't been born again yet, just give up now, surrender, come up here and get saved today, because you won't even start on this life without being born again. Except you be born again, you can't even see the kingdom of heaven. And with that, I will dismiss you to collect your children, uh, go get lunch, and become spirit-led people. We'll see you tonight, and we're going to have a big hoedown in the spirit. <laughs> now, I do want to say... They don't want to leave. Yeah, they don't want to leave. Well, they can stay for the second service. <laughs> All right, I'll give the platform back to you. <laughs> Go ahead and stand, and oh, that's hot. <laughs> If you just, you know, I wrote like four pages of notes, so. I only had two. I will have to revisit, <laughs> have to revisit some of those notes. <laughs> but tonight, the Lord has given us a very specific strategy to go after deaf ears tonight. Um, this is good when you have time to rest. You can hear, really hear from him very specific things. And I said, why not blind eyes? And he goes, I said, deaf ears, did you not hear? Hmm. So if you, if you have hearing aids or have ear problems or you're, you are deaf or you know someone who is, I just want to encourage you. I, I have great faith that the Lord's going to open up deaf ears tonight. And if he doesn't, then we'll just keep preaching about deaf ears until he opens one. So I don't think it'll be that hard. So let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you. Thank you for this word. I pray that again, the Holy Spirit would give us boldness to not only be spirit filled, but spirit led. I pray for an extra measure of the Holy Spirit to fall on each person. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Yeah.